And we are live. Keyport's history is rooted in testing undersea vehicles. Established in 1914, Naval Torpedo Station Keyport began testing in the adjacent waters by firing steam torpedoes at suspended nets in the bay. An observer with a stopwatch tracked steam bubbles, and the location of a puncture in the net determined bearing drift and depth performance. In the 1950s, the first undersea tracking range was installed in Daybot Bay in the Hood Canal. The nine nautical square mile site was selected for its security and optimal acoustic properties for vehicle developmental testing. Using similar tracking technologies, the 50 nautical square mile Nanus range was installed in the mid-60s in partnership with the Canadian government. This range was established to expand the in-water capabilities required for torpedo testing. These technologies have sufficiently supported undersea test and evaluation until now. <coughs> The need for advanced undersea test and evaluation methods and infrastructure is required to support the rapid delivery of advanced capability to the fleet. The Pacific Northwest Underwater Laboratory of the Future will have reconfigurable, composable nodes, networked and individually addressable. This will allow the ranges to support advanced underwater communications and sensor development. Variants of these nodes will support a portable capability for anywhere, anytime t and &E events. This will still allow the ranges to support cooperative track, but it will also allow for non-cooperative track of systems that are not amenable to traditional tracking technologies. Sparse tracking concepts and laser light pingers are also candidate technologies. Future range concepts include using in-flight drones, sea gliders, and buoys, all augmented with optical systems to support vehicle communications through the air-water interface. A significant challenge to the undersea T&E community is to develop affordable and realistic threat emulation systems that can adequately stress systems under test. UUV swarming is one potential solution. In order to support the complex T&E events of the future, modeling and simulation will be needed to properly test the autonomy of large area, long duration systems prior to in-water testing. Modeling and simulation will also be needed to properly plan these complex t and &E events. Hardware in the loop will be part of the future Pacific Northwest Underwater Laboratory. This capability will build confidence in systems before exposing them to the risks and expense of testing in undersea environments, and it will also support rapid technology development by reducing the time between test iterations. Existing and new infrastructure will be used in future live virtual constructive vignettes as part of an overall Navy capability-based test and evaluation strategy. Keyport has demonstrated a distributed test over Estran where live range data stimulated constructive entities. The Pacific Northwest Underwater Laboratory of the Future will provide flexibility and reconfigurability to support undersea t and &E needs guaranteeing we can continue to provide decision makers with unbiased quality evidence of technology and system performance and ensure warfighter mission effectiveness. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our third session, uh, engagement session with industry. Um, at this time, as I'm transitioning to um, our slideshow, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put up our first uh, poll question uh, of the day. So we are again curious to see who is attending today. And so we're asking those certification socioeconomic questions that we all like to have when we're working on government contracts. And of course, we understand that some of you are here representing um, business or other than small business. So it looks like we have a, a good number of small business. That's great. And about 74% of you have voted, so you get a couple of seconds and I'm closing it. Close and share. 
so that you can see by far the largest number are all small business and then of course the subsets of those. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, at this time, I'm going to have Miss Tiffany Scroggs go ahead and uh, introduce uh, PTAC. Yeah, thank you for um, partnering with PTAC on today's industry engagement event. Um, my name is Tiffany Scroggs, and I manage the PTAC for Washington State. And others will hear Kathy Kokus's voice. Uh, she manages the the uh, PTAC subcenter over by our, our Navy bases here in Washington. Um, and just real quick about PTACs, the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers are designed to help businesses succeed in government contracting. We are sprinkled all across the United States, Guam and Puerto Rico, and we offer no cost technical assistance to any business interested in selling to any level of government. So businesses can call us and set up an appointment or email us and use our online form to set up a time to talk to an advisor about anything related to selling to the government. Market research, uh, we do proposal reviews, we help businesses understand their post-award compliance issues, um, we might help you overcome payment issues, that kind of thing. So anything related to government contracting, we are here for you. I've listed the local PTAC um, directory at the Association of PTAC website there, aptac-us.org, as well as my contact information there. Um, so it's a del delight to be here today. I will be helping with the chat and Kathy will be helping with the technology. And with that, we'll turn it over to you, Dave. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you, um, Tiffany. And I wanna just say good morning or afternoon. Uh, to all that are participating today in our uh, third uh, industry engagement session. Uh, my name is David Walls and I am the Deputy for Small Business Programs here at the Naval Undersea Warfare Center, uh, Division Keyport, and I want to welcome you to this industry day. We're happy that you're taking time out of your busy day to spend an hour with us and learn more about uh, Keyport. Um, and before I introduce our speakers today, I wanna just establish some ground rules. Uh, as we're going through the presentations today, um, you have an opportunity to ask questions. We do have a chat box. Um, and when, you're, when you have a question, please start the question with the word question. Um, that way we, we know that it, it is a question and not just a statement. Um, and as we go into our panel discussion later, um, we have quite a few panel um, uh, you know, representatives today. And when, if you have a question for that uh, panel member, if you could just put question and the panel member's name that you would like to answer your question. Um, and like I said, uh, uh, Ms. Scroggs is gonna be uh, monitoring and she'll be um, asking the questions for you. Um, today's session will begin with an overview of the test and evaluation department by Mr. Gary Zook. He is the principal test and evaluation technologist for the department. And this will be followed, like I said, by a panel discussion with representatives from the department. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Gary Zook the, um, from the test and evaluation department. Uh, Mr. Zook began his career with the Naval Undersea Warfare Center Division Keyport in 1980 and has been involved in a test and evaluation most of his career. His early years were spent developing land-based test capability for, perform for performance testing of torpedo propulsion components. His current thrust since becoming the test and evaluation uh, principal technology is ensuring Keyport can perform its t and &E mission uh, for ever-evolving systems and increasing complex scenarios. He has an MSME from the University of Portland and an MPA from Indiana University. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Zook. Thank you. I come up, Dave. Oh, so again, I'm Gary Zook. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I've been at Keyport almost 40 years and weeks. It's been uh, quite a, quite, there's still a lot of, lot of this slide kind of dovetails. Uh, everybody got in the video. 
in a, a quite a bit, but hopefully some uh, kind of gist of, of what top part busy today's uh, um, again teachers doing way way back uh, uh, of course hey, Mr. Zook this is a uh, Dave um, just so yes, you know, your, your your audio is kind of breaking up back and back to me I'm I'm uh, I do is it is everybody else uh, breaking up? Is it broken up video, or is it machine? It, it's just you, Mr. Zook, and we are getting comments that they're having a difficult time, and it looks like you might have an unstable um, connection because you're a bit freezing up a bit as well. Um, what to do? Um. I got logged back in, but I take some time um, to kind of see if it gets better. Is there someone that could do part of the slides while you log out and log back in? Yeah, Tatum. I think Marty can do this. Marty. I can give it a shot. I haven't uh, haven't reviewed the slide in a while, but. <clears throat> uh, well, mainly. The our OV one will be good while I'm trying to log in. Will do. So can we go back to the previous slide? I don't have control of the slides. So as you know, Gary was trying to introduce uh, the test and evaluation department. Uh, you know, this this slide here is is trying to represent the efforts we've been putting into growing our capability. <clears throat> uh, we've been, you know, we talk about today's Navy, and there's particular things that we've been doing for a very long time in test and evaluation that we're really good at but things are changing and changing rapidly. And, and basically we've gone down a path of trying to uh, uh, evolve, you know, from, I guess, the, the traditional type of work we've done, which are, you know, very often short events and localized ranges and, and limited, limited environments, limit, limited threat environments, and move to what is represented on the right side in the picture, which is a, uh, an environment where we have all kinds of different assets that are geographically dispersed. They include things like UUVs, unmanned underwater uh, vehicles, uh, and, and a huge amount of information that is being shared over a distributed area. You know, it could technically be over a, a huge geographical area. And that's gonna require a lot of different technology. So, <clears throat> What we've uh, what we've been embarking on is 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 transitioning from again where we're at now to you know using uh, distributed uh, underwater networks, uh, uh, different types of, uh, of of modeling and simulation. Uh, if you if you're not familiar with the term live virtual and constructive, it's it's the direction we're moving. It involves uh, uh, extensive modeling and simulation as as well as uh, integrating that with live testing. And, uh, uh, and the idea is, is that, or the concept is, is that, you know, we really don't have the ability to form the large groups or to bring together the large groups of assets uh, that are necessary to conduct a real test. So how do you augment that, augment that when you can't necessarily maybe have a, you know, a, a helo on, on, on location? Well, you can use a simulation with qualified operators and you can create the scenario whereby you can do testing in that live virtual and constructive environment. So um, I um, can take a look here and see if there's some important bullet I'm missing. Have you got back on, Gary? Um, I think you said, so you can to the, uh, for me, you're still on the right side of the slide, difficulties. breaking up. Okay. Yeah. So, Gary, someone suggested you turn off your video. And we are not hearing anything. Uh, can you hear? It is still broken up. Okay. okay.
and I'll reboot. Well, I guess I'll try to continue then. Um, let's see. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, I, I really don't, and maybe I can solicit some help from some of the other people on the call uh, that are from Keyboard here, but I think what Gary was trying to just show is that, you know, one of the things that we, what we do is we have uh, uh, several contracts that, you know, that we, we use to support uh, the types of work we do in the test and evaluation department. Uh, I won't read them for you, but uh, there's a few of them that are there. And uh, again, if there's somebody uh, who might want to elaborate on some of those, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, well, when we get into the panel discussion, we'll go ahead and um, have the folks that are within the panel um, talk about some of these contracts because we have some of the uh, contracting officer representatives uh, that will be participating uh, in the panel and they can probably go into these a little bit more. Okay, let's next slide then, please. More contracts. So. Don't have anything to add here, so. So I think what Gary is trying to show here is that, uh, you know, Keyport has some very unique capabilities. Uh, uh, besides a lot of it, you know, pre pretty extensive land-based testing uh, capabilities that we'll probably discuss a little bit later. We also have uh, several ranges that are, uh, are augmented with some very unique equipment. And uh, just to point out, you know, you look at the top right uh, picture, that's our yard torpedo uh, tender, tube tender, uh, tender, uh, test tender. That is, and in any case, it uh, it's uh, uh, our main workhorse for our ranging, uh, live ranging. It can launch targets. It can launch UUVs. It has a very large crane on it, and uh, it also has a unique capability in that it also has two uh, heavyweight torpedo tubes uh, installed in the forward, you know, the the bow of the of the ship. It's one of three vessels. Uh, in the Navy that isn't a submarine that has torpedo tubes, so it is really uh, uh, dedicated for testing. Um, we have some recovery vehicles down, the TWR, and I'm going to jump down to the, the very bottom, which is a barge and the IX-536. You know, what's unique about that is a lot of our, our, our tests uh, don't require moving vehicles or their difference of sorts. So when you look at this particular one, uh, Large, it has a, a very large moon pole in the center of it, supported by a very large crane that you can see the structure over it. And it allows us basically to go out into all kinds of different types of water, uh, maybe be mobile, maybe be stationary, uh, and, and lower uh, various tests, you know, uh, units under test in order to do whatever testing we're doing. So, next slide, please. So, uh, Marty, do you want some? Do you want some fiscal years when some of these contracts are going to go out over? Um, you know, maybe when we get into the discussion about, uh, as, as Dave indicated, about uh, um, the contracts, we can do it then. Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, this is the, uh, the acoustic text slab within the uh, code, what we call Code 20, the Test and Evaluation Department. I happen to be very close to this. This is the stuff in my division. Uh, the acoustic te test lab has a very extensive uh, land-based uh, in-water in capability. Uh, in the upper right corner, uh, left corner that is, you see a tank with a, a, a cartoonish uh, torpedo in it with an array. And basically it's a tank that allows us to simulate in-water runs or test transducers uh, in a pressurized environment uh, that is in water that we can control uh, uh, you know, from 95 degrees to ambient temperatures. And by next year, we're hoping uh, with our current investments that we'll be able to simulate water down to 40 degrees. So it allows us to simulate various pressures and temperatures again, which are all important when you start talking about acoustic transmissions. Uh, we have other, you know, the right below that is our acoustic uh, test facility, which is a the only at, uh, in salt water acoustic test facility. And inside there's a, a series of, uh, of, of cranes and such that, and, and mounting systems that can lower systems into the water for testing. And on the far right, we have a, 
what we call our transducer automated test uh, facility. And we test a variety of, of transducers and including uh, torpedo array systems. We do that for primarily for production purposes, but we also can do that to support uh, um, uh, various, you know, R&D type projects. Um, and uh, all of these uh, facilities, uh, you know, have the potential to to be supported by our, you know, our, our industry partners. So next slide, please. The Pinger tracking uh, group is also within uh, my division. And basically, you know, when we when you look at uh, the ranges that we have, there are there are needs there is a need to track these things, not just for situational awareness, but to be able to evaluate performance and uh, uh, to um, uh, be able to locate things if they if they uh, if they sink, all those types of th situations like that. So in this particular case, what these this particular group has the ability to do is augment uh, vehicles, uh, you know, of various sizes with a what we call a pinger, it's basically a transponder that is, you know, projects at certain frequencies and uh, our ranges and fleet ranges can, uh, if, if we're on a fleet range, can pick up those signals and then do their, their calculations to estimate positions. So uh, it's, it's a pretty extensive group. There's a lot of work in, in that they support not just our local testing, but they support fleet, of, fleet training uh, uh, events as well as um, and such. So. Um, I think one of the things that's very uh, that's changing rapidly is that with the uh, introduction of certain UVs and vehicles that are very small, we have to start to learn how to miniaturize and create smaller, smaller uh, packages that can fit within vehicles, you know, that fit within within the existing space, or if external uh, doesn't affect you know the dynamics and the operation of the vehicles. Next slide. Hey, Marty, I, I think I'm back online here. Take, take, here take over. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry about that, everybody. So I got my iPad working. Um, so we just wanted to show some of the reoccurring types of things we, we uh, buy on a regular basis. Not going to go through the whole list, but you can uh, see some of the things on there. Everything from, you know, the, the furniture kinds of things to, to support tools, those kind of things. And, and I will point out there on the vessels, you know, Marty mentioned the... Uh, the vessels and kind of things we have. And of course there's uh, unique safety equipments and, and things that go with that. So um, I'll leave that up for a second so you can kind of get a peek at it. Um, but uh, uh, with that, we'll go to the next slide. Um, and uh, here's some other things. Uh, you can see there's, again, there's that kind of marine uh, um, flavor to, to a lot of the things we do. And, um, and that will always be the case. Uh, you know, our, our fleet of uh, test vessels are getting old and do require fair amounts of maintenance. We were able to, to, get, uh, um, to get our, our big crafts uh, down and, and get significant maintenance done to them this year. One just came back for that, one's just in it, but it's a continuing issue and we have. Uh, we'll point out too that the, uh, at the uh, last bullet, Sub bullet under the the major bullet says submerged object recovery device. We call that our sword. Um, we do have our own ROVs that we use for getting things off the bottom, and uh, those are the kind of things that we do need repaired and, and does require some 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 special skills to, to keep those kind of things running. And um, and the future need looks again the, the the guys are looks like we're in need of bulk oil here soon. So I believe that was our last slide. Sorry for all the confusion on that. I zoom all the time on my, my uh, personal laptop with family members. Today's the first day I've had any issue at all, of course. Um, but uh, thanks, Marty, for helping me out. And I guess I owe him one. So um, with that, Dave, I guess I'll give it back to you. All right, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Zook. Um, real quick, uh, um, Mr. Zook, uh, with the, the film that we showed at the very beginning, um, was yeah. there anything that you wanted to uh, talk about as far as like the range, uh, range of the future or anything sure, like that? Sure, sure, thank you. Um, so that was our, um, you know, our vision of where we need to go in the future, particularly with our uh, um, underwater range capabilities. And there was also some pictures there of, 
of some land-based capabilities where we're doing what's called hardware in the loop simulation, stimulation, simulation, so that we can, um, uh, you know, test things on land without the huge expense of doing them in water and get things ready to run in water. So where we're at is that uh, we've just started the process of uh, um, uh, procuring a, a prototype node system and that the video you saw pictures of some nodes there on the bottom. Uh, we're using a Newick Newport's OTA process to, to get that capability. The idea is to get a one node system so we can start learning from it and do some prototype testing and development. Uh, so for those that are interested in that, um, there should be some information you should be able to get from, from Dave and, and his team and where we're at in that process. Um, but ultimately what we look at is uh, there's going to be a large amount of equipment we're going to have to buy to what's called range recapitalization. In other words, replace our aging underwater uh, um, systems that we have in, in uh, the Daybob Bay and up in the range we share with Canada. And that's going to be a long involved process. It's going to be a many year project uh, to do that. Um, but the idea is that instead of just doing uh, what we do now, which is called acoustic tracking, um, we have, we're trying to make sure we have the capability to do what we're, we, uh, we call it our underwater laboratory. We all need to be able to test the new whiz bang things that are being developed for underwater communications, um, for, um, uh, and underwater navigation and those kind of things. So, um, and, and, and with a huge focus on sensors, whatever kind of new sensors that uh, the Navy will need in the future, we're trying to develop the capability to be able to test those by attaching them to those nodes under the water so we can do a full test on those. Uh, and hopefully that helps a little bit with an understanding of what that, that video was all about. Over. Excellent. I appreciate that. Thanks so much for uh, for uh, talking about the range of the future. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Zook. Uh, despite the, the the technical difficulties, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Marty, for stepping in. Uh, I don't think we missed uh, uh, missed a beat at all on that. So appreciate that. And um, I, I know we just have a, a couple minutes before we transition to the panel, but. Uh, uh, Tiffany, any questions out there? Yeah, there's several. Uh, John Reeves asked, you noted that your test vessel, vessels are aging. Will programs for replacement vessels be managed through Keyport or as part of a larger NAVC program? Thank you. Um, as part of a larger NAVC program, uh, so what we do is we, uh, we, have our, um, we have a program where we submit our, our needs uh, to to, uh, to NAVC about you know, what we need as far as keeping those vessels going. But ultimately, they're, they're really owned by, by NAVC. And uh, NAVC you know, ultimately be controlling um, uh, if and when we get new vessels. Now, we would be very involved in determining those requirements and things, but, but it's a very much a joint effort with us and, and, uh, and NAVC. So they're really looking for us to, and again, we just sent the ships through some, some major um, overhauls to try and get them well baselined. And we'll probably be asked to, to do some more, what we call slab shelf life extension programs. And I think actually Doug Ray's on the phone. Maybe Doug, if you're there, can you talk to that a little more? Doug, you're muted. Yeah, I'm, now I'm oh, unmuted. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So both YTTs will be going through what's called a SLEP, which is basically a repower. All new, all new diesel engines, new uh, dynamic positioning system, automated control system, uh, switchboard. And so we expect uh, to do a SLEP in FY21 and another SLEP in FY23. And uh, I think those would be contracted through Puget Sound Naval Shipyard is probably who's gonna let, let the contracts for those. Um, and then um, in FY22, we are also doing a, a small YC type barge overhaul. And that'll also probably be contracted through PSNS and then 
and uh, FY23, in addition to the, uh, the repower or slep, we're going to do another YC barge overhaul. So we've got two barges and uh, two repowers in the uh, 21, 22, and 23. Um, and then when we get into 24, we'll start redoing an, uh, a regular overhaul on one of the TWRs. And then we'll do another TWR overhaul in uh, 25 and another overhaul of YTT in, in 25. And so um, all these contracts will be posted on, or uh, the RFPs will be posted on Beta SAM, either, either by Keyport or Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. And um, is that, does that answer the question over? Yes, I think I think you guys both answered that. Thank you, Doug. Um, Dave, I'm going to keep going unless you stop me here. Um, what are some of the most challenging technical competencies or personnel to find and retain? And why do you think those challenges exist? Um, this Gary, I'll, I'll try and jump in a little bit on that. Uh, um, I think Obviously, we're always in need of uh, computer scientists, computer engineers uh, for the, the advancement we're doing in those areas. Uh, you know, electrical engineering, we, we do a quite a bit of our own. Um, let me just back up a second and say, one of our core capabilities is, is that we have to design many of our test systems ourselves because you just can't go, off, go out and buy something off the shelf that will do some of the underwater testing and land-based testing we need to do. So we need people that either can be involved in designing and, and getting those things built or making sure that they definitely can get uh, people that, um, we, we need people that can understand how you would uh, get a contractor or a vendor or something to build that equipment. So uh, we very much bring people in and train them up in, cons you know, like ocean engineering, the mechanical engineers, uh, you know, we, they, they learn uh, about how, you, how things uh, got to survive underwater with corrosion and all the, the things that go with the special requirements for using things out in an ocean environment. Um, so yeah, we definitely do need, we're always looking for, um, uh, people in those areas. Uh, we have a, uh, we always have a need for people that um, understand underwater acoustics, digital, digital signal processing. Um, and I can, you know, that, that's just kind of maybe Walt or, or and Walt's uh, more involved in that division that, that does that kind of work. Walt, you want to jump in, talk to some of the people we need? Are you on mute, Walt? Am I on mute now? No, you're not <laughs> <Okay>. now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, could someone repeat the, just re real quickly repeat the question. Uh, related to the most challenging technical competencies or personnel to find and retain, and, and okay. why do those challenges exist? Okay, so um, I would say that we, we have a, we are, uh, we do have some limited hiring ability, you know, we are not, the, the floodgates are not open, so we have to pick and choose. We, we go through a very rigorous process of, of uh, racking and stacking uh, what we need. We work together uh, between branches and divisions to distribute the, the little bit of hiring that we can do. We are focused on, on getting those resources from contractors. You know, our, we, we, I think we're pretty good at getting the basics. Uh, Gary's right, computer, experienced computer science people, and I think that that's really the challenge is uh, is a little bit more of experience level is where we, we challenge. And then there are some, some uh, knowledge areas when I would say this is um, test engineers um, and, and the, the next level of uh, application of what I would call the basics toward what we do is our, is our thing. And uh, one of the things that we've hoped to be able to do is to utilize contractors in these areas um, to as a factory to then grow them up and then uh, and then w the very few people that we if we need to hire we would hire people that we've been using as contractors maybe that have got some experience in the test 
say as test engineers or acoustic engineers or um, electrical or computer science. Thank you. Uh, great, very helpful. Um, and again, Dave, I'm going to keep going with questions unless you stop. Yeah, me. let's go ahead and um, pause okay. on the questions real quick great. because um, I want to go ahead and uh, introduce just the the panel because I think the panel, um, you know, Gary's already been going to some of the panel members, so let's just introduce them real quick, and um, and then uh, we'll let them uh, just uh, say a little bit about themselves, and uh, and then we'll go ahead and continue with the questions because it sounds like there's a, probably a, a lot of questions out there. So um, you just heard from uh, Mr. Zook, and you just heard from uh, Mr. Walt Harris, and um, hey, Walt, do you want to just uh, talk a little bit about uh, what what you do and and your position there in uh, the test and evaluation department? Yeah, I'm the, the chief engineer at the department level. Uh, we also have online some of our, uh, I think at, at least three, two or three of our division principal engineers. Um, so we are kind of the technical oversight and uh, we, we kind of have a backup on rigor and, and like I said, technical um, rigor, technical rigor and um, making sure that we're um, applying the right knowledge and the right experience to different efforts that we do. So we're responsible for a system engineering process in our department. Um, we work with um, Gary on uh, new technology and ca new capability technology and um, investment planning. Um, we work with our project management competency group on making sure the right technical reviews are in projects and the right, again, the right system engineering processes are applied. Thank you. Excellent, great, thank you. Um, and then we've heard from uh, Doug Ray already once, and Doug, can you just uh, uh, let us know a little bit about what you do there for the, uh, uh, for Code 20? Okay, so at Code 20, um, I work with NAVAIR to schedule uh, regular overhauls of the of the uh, barges, the YTTs, and the TWRs. And that means looking four or five years out for the next overhaul or, uh, or major maintenance period. And then what we do is five years out, we kind of get a control in the money of what that's gonna cost. And we get that on the calendar and it gets approved. And um, so typically our schedule is gonna be, we're gonna overhaul a YTT every five years. We're going to overhaul a TWR every four years, and we are going to um, overhaul a barge every six to eight years. And so I either work with PSNS on their, they do the contracting, or we do the contracting at Keyport. Um, and uh, so we set the uh, requirements for what we want done during the overhaul. Uh, you know, as far as dry docking, painting, ship halts, and things like that. My preference, and Dave, if I'm saying this wrong, let me know, but my preference is to, is to maximize competition on these, uh, on all these overhauls and major maintenance. Uh, that means that, uh, you know, I have not required to have a master ship repair agreement or to have a, uh, uh, an ABR, which is a uh, some uh, boat repair agreement, but that you know that the yard that does this work is is qualified to do the work, and that's what we look for technically. Uh, we try and write the uh, the overhaul specs in plain English instead of NAVC standards, and uh, we try and use uh, ABS specifications or Coast Guard specifications. So that uh, the the con so that competition is maximized, and that has been very helpful to us in in getting uh, multiple bidders on uh, uh, a lot of the contracts that have been awarded. Um, over. Excellent, thank you, Doug. Um, and then uh, is uh, Mr. Tony Cook online today? He's having some uh, Zoom issues. Okay, thank you. Um, next, uh, how about Shannon Knight? Is Shannon Knight on? All right, how about uh, Sam Goat? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. 
Great. Can you uh, just uh, introduce yourself to the, the audience and a little bit about what you do with uh, the test and evaluation department? Uh, my name is Sam Gwig, um, and I'm, my title is a division principal engineer. And Walt Harris was our department our chief engineer mentioned a bit of what we do. So um, my division is the test resources planning and coordination. So um, usually if somebody wants to come and use our range, uh, usually or most of the time, um, it goes through our division. Um, if there is some special piece of equipment that needs to be procured, purchased, uh, designed, uh, we, we do a bit of that. Uh, we have some software work we do as well. Um, and we have that, um, I'm gonna say design application engineering uh, in my division. And uh, as Walt mentioned earlier, I'm kind of the oversight as far as um, uh, the technical oversight for the division. That's, that's in short what, what my position is. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Brian Adams, are you on? Yes, I am. Uh, good morning, Brian Adams. I'm the head for the uh, undersea test range division. Uh, I don't design the systems. I don't do the evaluation of the test data. I go out and I actually operate the ships and operate the systems. Mine's much more on the mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, the maintenance, uh, fighting with corrosion and that type of thing. Uh, Doug does the long-term care of the boats. I fight the daily battles to get them between the, the overhaul periods. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Brad Biddle, are you on? Okay, and uh, we heard from Marty already. And, uh, and Marty, do you mind uh, just introducing yourself uh, and what, what you do with the uh, test and evaluation department? Um, Marty Tatum again, and uh, I work in the USW uh, system acquisition and assessment division. And we have quite an extensive range of things that we do. Uh, the, uh, um, hold on a second here, things we do, uh, as I kind of, Talked to the earlier slides. We have an acoustic test facility that we talked about, um, and I won't cover that anymore. We also have an analysis group uh, that does uh, analysis and a recon uh, reconstruction of, of test events. Uh, kind of going back to one of the questions that was asked, uh, you know, one of the areas that we are evolving into and finding difficulty, the, those hard uh, people to acquire are data scientists, people that are really good at modeling and simulation, things like modeling, uh, machine learning. I think the primary reason is just because of the demand for that uh, type of expertise and uh, people are recognizing that there are all kinds of ways of exploiting data and uh, there's powerful tools out there that are, it's hard to get a hold of those people. Uh, we also maintain an environmental test facility uh, over at our Banger uh, facility. And basically we do things like uh, shock vibration climatics. That's also an area that's important, that's uh, difficult to get a seasoned people in. Uh, I think, you know, just because of our geographical area, you know, there, we find that some of our more talented people decide they would rather design rockets and participate in things like that. And that, that is very difficult to compete with. Uh, but uh, we've ha we do have good talented people. Um, we also have quite an extensive failure analysis laboratory that does things like material characterization, uh, electron microscopy, different stuff like that, uh, failure analysis for, you know, supporting reliability growth. Um, and the, the last area that we have is a group that we call our, uh, our, our acquisition group. And basically what they do is perform a quality assurance uh, function and they're heavily involved in contracts and uh, designing tests, uh, profiles for different products and making recommendations to our program offices. So um, I think that covers it over. Excellent, I appreciate that. And that kind of leads into the next uh group of folks I wanted to introduce. It's our contract officer representative. So I'll, I'll go ahead and start with uh, Ms. Brandy Fend. Uh, Brandy, can you just introduce yourself and just uh, and, and, uh, give an overview of the contract that you support? All right, uh, so I'm, I'm not hearing anything from Brandy, so we'll go to the next person I have on, and that's Mr. Uh, Al Bethke. Uh, Mr. Bethke, do you mind uh, just sharing about the contract that you support? Sure, uh, first uh, I'll talk about Brandy's contract because it used to be mine, and I still su help support her on that. That's the Acoustic Trials and Range Sustaining uh, contract. 
it was uh, just re-awarded. Um, it's a five-year contract. It was just re-awarded, but it uh, supports uh, uh, um, noise evaluations and um, testing, and then also uh, supports range uh, sustainment, uh, unique projects on the range. My project, my uh, uh, contract, which has one more year to go, um, is the uh, Technical and Industrial Support Services contract. And we handle a lot of the things that uh, Marty was just talking about, as far as uh, environmental testing, um, actual uh, ranging, as far as, far as um, uh, doing the physical part of the ranging. Uh, right now we're doing uh, Mark 30 and uh, uh, depot support, and also aircraft uh, motor uh, depot support, aircraft actuator motors, not, not the big things that make it fly. Um, that and and we also do uh, do some analysis with this contract, and um, it is under the Seaport uh, e services. Over. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Bethke. Um, next, uh, since I have this slide up and it's the uh, Hawaii Support Services, I want to introduce Miss April uh, Larue. If you can go ahead and just. Uh, uh, give us an overview of this uh, task order. That would be great. Um, yes, um, thanks, Dave. Um, yes, my name is April LaRue. I am the contracting officer's rep for the Hawaii Services contract. I'm located out at Pearl Harbor, and our contract encompasses uh, work coming out of Ford Island, Pearl Harbor, um, Guam, and Japan. Um, just an update to the current slide. Uh, we are currently in option year two of a four-year contract, and our contract and pop date will be in August 2022. Excellent, and, thank you. And if we can, uh, if Ms. Uh, Ms. Baird, let's, let, uh, sorry if I butcher your name, Lucille or Lucille Baird, um, if you go ahead and uh, talk about your contract. Hello, good morning. I'm Lisa Baird. Um, I were, I'm the core on the sword contract, uh, which is the piece of equipment that recovers test equipment that's submerged. Um, and um, it's an upgrade from the old one to the new one. And that contract was awarded this year. And um, I, I think it was mentioned earlier in the brief. Thank you. It, thank you. And uh, it was mentioned earlier in the brief, so uh, appreciate that. And then uh, we have the, uh, the the core for the San Diego Support Services, uh, Ms. Adriana Spooner. Uh, if you can go ahead and uh, just give a, a quick uh, brief on this service contract. Hello, my name is Adriana Spooner. I'm the core for the Detachment San Diego Technical Services contract, and we serve the Fleet Test and Evaluation Center, um, the Magnetic Silencing Facility support. We have program information management and administrative and comments support, and we also serve the underwater vehicle and underwater tracking range equipment, UTRE, uh, which includes our Mark 30 and Pinger shops down in San Diego. Great, thank you. And last but not least, uh, Ms. Crystal Magnuson, who's uh, with the Acquisition Oversight with uh, the Test and Evaluation Department. Uh, Crystal? Uh, she was texting me that she's having some Zoom issues also. Okay, great. Um, uh, so with that, we've uh, you've been everybody's been introduced to our panel. Um, you've you've heard a little bit about what they do. Um, you, you've gotten an overview. So um, we'll go ahead and start um, answering some of the questions that are out there. And if there's any new questions that come on, um, go ahead and, and put them in for the, the the presenters. So with that, Tiffany, I'll go ahead and. Uh, um, Hand it yeah, over to you. thank you. And I'm, I'm going to start with the most recent question and work my way back. Um, the question is from Heather. Do test experts have any ability to influence prime contractors to work more with small businesses for any of the upcoming projects? Dave, do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, I'll I'll try to answer that one. And if anybody um, from uh, the department uh, wants to chime in as well. So um, with our contracts, um, whenever we have to go out for a new contract, we, we do have acquisition strategies. Um, and with those acquisition strategies, we will go out and uh, just uh, see who's out there that can do it. So you, you might see something uh, called a sources sought. Um, and the sources sought is how we develop that acquisition to see if we will go uh, with a small business set aside. Um, if it's not a small business set aside, if the, 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 the market research shows that we have to do a full and open, then we always try and, um, you know, we, we, we always, uh, put a, an evaluation factor in there for the uh, s uh, small business utilization. So that really um, encourages subcontracting with some of our um, large uh, government contractors. Um, and also, you know, a lot of times when we, some of the things that we have to do, and this might be a little side note, sometimes we have um, uh, procurement requirements that might be a limited source requirement. Um, and those don't shut the doors on small businesses either. Those, um, if you uh, have a partnership or you're a reseller uh, with uh, a large uh, uh, company or a provider, then, um, then you can definitely participate. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question completely. Uh, I don't know if there's somebody from the department that might wanna add, add something. Thanks, Dave. I think I think that's good. Um, can you talk a little bit about? It? There's some bigger questions about Code 20. Um, question is: Is Code 20 considering mobile range solutions? Uh, Vice just refreshing the current fixed infrastructure. Um, and I think the context of the question said the current UTIC OTA RPP is just focused on replacing fixed infrastructure. Is that a good question for one of yeah. the panelists? Yeah, I, I got that. This is Gary. So um, way back to the video, which has been quite a while ago now, um, the words were in there that uh, uh, variants of whatever solution we come up for our range recapitalization will be used for mobile solutions. So we very much understand that uh, we're going to have test requirements in the future of what we call long duration, very large area emissions. Uh, we also are very involved with um, uh, testing with the fleet and training with the fleet. So very much we, we need to have mobile solutions for the future. And uh, that's one thing we're working right now is taking existing systems we have and making mobile variants of those. We're improving upon our mobile capabilities so we can do that. And, and again, that's a big part of our focus in the future is being able to basically take our T&E equipment out into wherever we need to take it, the kind of test anytime, anywhere concept is still very much alive. Thank you. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, can somebody please uh, discuss, do you have a need for LVC development in support of future analysis? And if um, somebody could tell me what LVC is, that'd be helpful. Yeah, for this me. is Gary. So that's live virtual constructive um, test events. And I believe Marty touched on that before I was struggling trying to get back in. We actually have a group in our detachment in Hawaii that's working, uh, working that uh, pretty hard as we're part of the overall NRNDE LVC community. Um, what we hope to do in the future is be that live piece of that um, capability with our ranges. So in other words, we could put things on the range and either put that information in as it's happening into, into an LVC event or record information that's live and feed that into an LVC event. Um, so yeah, we're very much a player in that. And, and, uh, and I think that's what Marty was hopefully, he was talking to that, that ultimately you need to get a, when you test systems, if you can get it into a system assistance test sooner, uh, the quicker you can find out how it's gonna perform um, uh, and uh, be able to, to do those assessments. So yes, we're very much uh, uh, a player in the LVC community. I, this Thank is Marty you. Tatum. Just, just to add a little bit, just to, somebody asked what, the, what LVC is and it's, it is an environment basically where live is, in, is live. It's real systems and real people operating, doing testing. Virtual is just like simulators. It's real people using simulated systems. And constructive is a concept where they talk about simulated people 
maybe using simulated systems. And there's all of those different components that are integrated together into basically one test scenario to fill in, for instance, for a real asset that we, we, not, we may not have availability uh, to at the time, but we can use simulation to support that overall test over. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, question to any panel member, what level of technical ex experience, junior to senior, are you expecting from the vendors on the contracts that were mentioned earlier in the slide deck? This is Al, I can talk about the TIS contract and, and maybe the ATRS contract also. Um, we're looking for the uh, kind of the, the gamut uh, as far as we'd like to have a senior, uh, someone uh, who who is a craftsman or let's just say uh, is expert in the field, but we also realize the need for um, uh, more journeyman and even uh, apprentice type positions to, uh, to keep the field going. Uh, great, thank you. And I, I also recommended to that that questionnaire, um, the person that submitted the question, to maybe pull up some existing or past solicitations and take a look at the key personnel or other requirements for for technical knowledge. Um, and so, and PTAC, that's the type of thing that PTAC would be delighted to support um, is doing that market research. Uh, next question here: um, Can you expand on electronic test equipment as a future need? It was one of the bullets in the early slides. Is anyone on there that can talk about electronic test equipment as a future need? Um, Walt or Sam, maybe? How about now? Can you hear me? Oh, yep, there you yeah, go, there Walt. We go. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly reply and then um, Sam can reply too. So was the question about electronic test equipment? Um, we, if it was, we are, I would say, uh, novices at um, building test capabilities into our equipment. I, I think we're pretty good at, at basic test planning capabilities. But when it comes, say, to, to building a circuit card with the built-in test capability, I have seen uh, that kind of thing on complicated DSP circuit cards where that as a sister card built right onto the same motherboard is a complete test. And as soon as they're done testing, it's broken off and, and, and the, there's, a, there's a connector that can be plugged in later. Um, at the same time, um, a lot of our test equipment is, is uh, for testing things like uh, Mark 30s or other things like that, or even some of our range equipment is, is not built in a manner that, that allows it to, be, to utilize the internet or networks or easily be, uh, they're, they're, very, they're old, they're more, more built in an old manner, kind of stove piped equipment. Um, so we need to, a lot of our range test equipment that is electronic, uh, needs to be upgraded. Um, some of the equipment we have in the different shops for testing some of the um, equipment that we like, Mark, like some of our um, uh, test vehicles or the Mark 30 stuff is probably aged already. So I, 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 over, maybe Sam could fill you in there or even Marty, Marty Tatum. Thank you. This is Marty, and I, I hopefully I understand the context of the question, but I, I just wanted to add that, and I didn't talk about it, but our environmental test facility, one of the areas that we are uh, have been doing for the last several years is getting involved in building functional test equipment. And basically, you know, you know we've got a lot of systems that are, that are very old, and we've been reconstituting them primarily for people like the program offices and, and some of the depots, different things like that, some, some factories, you know, uh, industry uh, partners. And basically using things like National Instruments uh, Lab View to try to, you know, to come to a common, you know, approach for test equipment and to revitalize them and, uh, uh, you know, uh, provide that capability out there. So I do think there's a need for that. I think there's, there's, 
you know, I, I think there's some of the other departments here at Keyport were probably more interested in that uh, just from the standpoint of, of uh, you know, obsolescence and, uh, and in some cases just the need for new capabilities over. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll move on to the next question. There's two questions that are, are kind of similar in, um, they're asking you to expand on electronic test equipment as a future need. And the second question, if you could talk about the capabilities you're looking for in a submerged object recovery device. So um, on the first one, electronic test equipment, can somebody talk about that as a future need? It looks like I, I think Walt and uh, Marty kind of hit that. Okay. Um, maybe see who's online, Brad. Uh, I mean, um, Brian Adams maybe could talk to the next part of the question about the submerged object recovery device. Yeah. Well, that's that's currently out and under contract for the, the refurb of the current uh, technology, but working as what's available out there, commercial off the shelf. Uh, right now, most of my systems have been built and must be deployed from my craft because they were very specific. As we go forward, if we start looking at a next generation craft, uh, I'd be very interested in what's plug and play, what's available commercial so I don't have to use my craft, that I can take it somewhere and plug into a either a, a, a leased or rented barge or place on another ship as long as I give it uh, Power and hydraulics, I'm good to go. I don't have to be tied to my craft. So that's that's more what I'm looking at for future use. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, another question here from Anita. I noticed, whoops, I noticed signal detection and analysis. Are electronics R&D or reverse engineering a focus of any of the gro groups here at Keyport? And if so, how should we connect? Can you ask that again, please? Yeah, that I noticed signal detection and analysis on one of the slides. Are electronics R&D or reverse engineering a focus of any of the groups here at Keyport? And if so, how should we connect? Should we refer him to Dave? Um, I, I guess I think a few of us are maybe still struggling with the rest of the question. Can, can, can the, the person type it again? Yeah, they, um, and they, there's additional, it's a women owned small business engineering mm -hmm. company that does electronics research and development as well as rapid prototyping. Um, and they're, they're interested in, in knowing if, if Keyport has a need for their services. Um, there's a chance there's a potential need in the, uh, um, we had talked about where we develop some of our own uh, teeny capabilities and range systems. So um, there's a chance there could be a connection there. So yeah, definitely um, it should, could get a hold of Dave and then we can uh, see if we can get him linked up with some people to see what they have to offer. Great, thank you. And we'll, we'll put Dave's email address in the chat function for everyone to see there um, here in a second. Um, and Tiffany, this is Dave um, real quick. Um, we are past our one hour time limit. Um, if we could just maybe um, ask one more question uh, so the uh, panel members um, can, can um, go off to their, their next meetings. Um, and then whatever questions are remaining, what I could do is I could uh, take those and send those to uh, our panel members to, to, to answer. Great, that, that sounds good. I will... Um... I will cut and paste all the written questions and tidy them up and send them over to you, Dave. Excellent. So if you want to do one more question, and, and, and there is a poll question that's up there. Hopefully people are seeing that as well. Um, <laughs> but uh, go ahead, one, one last question to the field, and, and then the, the remaining questions, we'll do our best to get those answered. Um, great, thank you. I'm trying to pick. Um, Nate asks, are there open solicitations to fill the need for test engineers and data analysts? How are these services typically initiated and contracted out? Yeah, this Gary, I, I believe in one of our earlier slides, slides or way back when we showed the, that uh, we, there's an ESS contract and um, that's typically what we use now. 
Um, so I don't, um, I guess I'm looking for some help on how we maybe answer that other than people applying to, you know, government job announcements. Um, so. From an analysis standpoint, this is Marty Tatum. I do believe, uh, you know, we do, we do have openings as, as uh, the demand signal uh, uh, allows and such like that. And we, as Gary suggested, we, we, our mechanism is that engineering services contract. Um, Great. And, and somebody asked earlier um, about the use of beta SAM. Are all contract opportunities posted on beta.sam uh, or are they going to be found elsewhere? So I'll go ahead and take that one. Thanks, Dave. So any of the service contracts, um, those will be posted within Seaport. So you have to be a Seaport MAC holder. Uh, MAC is multiple award contract. So you have to be a, a, a Seaport uh, contract holder in order to see those solicitations and, and bid as a prime. Um, anything else, if it's a single award type contract, uh, you know, such as uh, the SWORD, that was a single award contract, uh, those will be posted on beta.sam. And um, one, one other thing I'd like to point out with Seaport, if you are not a Seaport holder and you saw some of those uh, service contracts um, and, and those, uh, you know, interested you and your company, um, they open up Seaport about every two years. Um, the last update I received is they will be opening up Seaport for uh, what they call rolling admissions. So for, for some new companies to come in the fourth quarter of this fiscal year. So probably around September um, or time frame, and that will be posted on beta SAM. So rolling admissions will be on both uh, for Seaport will be on beta SAM. Um, and then they'll be uh, accepting proposals um, and closing out probably around the second quarter of next fiscal year with awards to new contractors at the end of FY21. So that's kind of how Seaport's gonna be working. So hopefully that answered the question. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, and it, yeah, there's there's other questions here. I will um, tidy them up there and get them over to you, Dave, so you um, can respond individually um, as you see fit. Excellent, thank you okay. so much. Great. And um, you know, I wanna thank the panelists um, and for, for joining us today. Uh, this is, uh, you know, very busy time for everybody. So uh, again, thank you uh, to the panelists and uh, to Mr. Zook. And, uh, um, and I want to thank everybody who attended today's uh, presentation. Uh, I know everybody is busy and uh, hopefully we got some good information out there uh, for you. Uh, so you know a little bit more about Keyport and some of the opportunities. Um, before signing off, you know, I do want to again uh, thank our, our PTAC partners um, for providing us the support and the platform so we can do these types of uh, uh, sessions. This session um, and all the sessions are being recorded and the link to the recordings and the, the slide uh, presentations will be posted on the Newick Keyport uh, website, public website under the resource tab. Um, so, so be checking there here in the next uh, couple days or a couple weeks um, as we uh, have to work through our public affairs office to get those posted. Uh, please contact me uh, if you have any other questions uh, in regards to uh, some of the opportunities at Keyport. Um, we could have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So again, just please uh, contact my office and uh, we can schedule that. And, uh, and this concludes th this session. Again, thank you everybody for attending and I hope that uh, you could come back uh, next week for uh, our session, uh, for session four um, of our industry day engagement sessions. And that's gonna be uh, looking at our code 30, um, which is our maintenance, engineering, and industrial operations department. So with that, uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Stay safe out there, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking next week. Again, thank you to all our panel members and PTAC. Have a great day. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.